Hello, I'm Jen. Welcome to or welcome back to my channel, Literary Love 123, where I like to drink coffee and combine my master's in English with my passion for the horror genre to talk about the books that I read. Today's video is a tag video. It is the Beauty in Books tag video. And because I am who I am, my addition to this tag is going to be gothic and horror focused. So after this quick intro, we'll come right back and I will tell you about books that I find beauty in. The Beauty and Books tag was created by Ruben at To Readers It May Concern and Emily at the linguist library i was tagged by pat at book chat with pat and i will link all of their channels down in the description box below there are nine prompts in this tag now my disclaimer is that what i find beautiful in books you might not find beautiful but you know the saying beauty is in the eye of the beholder I would love for you to do this tag. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments about what you find beautiful, but this is about what I find beautiful. So prompt number one, beauty in concept. For this prompt, I have chosen Reluctant Immortals by Gwendolyn Keist. This represents beauty in concept for me because Gwendolyn Keist reimagines the stories of Bertha Mason from Jane Eyre and Lucy Westenra from Dracula. She gives these women agency. She writes about what would happen if these women had both survived the events of the novels uh, from which they come. And she tells just a really interesting story about these two women characters, but she sets them in 1960s San Francisco. So it's just a really interesting story about what may have happened if these women had survived Dracula and Rochester. Prompt number two, beauty in opening lines. For this prompt, I chose The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, and I'm going to read the opening paragraph for you. No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed by some to dream. Hill House, not sane stood by itself against its heels, holding darkness within. It had stood so for 80 years and might stand for 80 more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm, and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there walked alone. Prompt number three is beauty in character. And for this prompt, I have chosen Abe, who is the main character in my favorite book, The Fisherman by John Langan. Abe is a widower who is telling us the story of how fishing saved his life, but almost cost him his life too. And the way that he talks about his deceased wife and his grief and the process of reaching out to a younger widower and kind of mentoring him in a way and walking him through his grief and how they share fishing together mixed in with the midst of a really terrifying cosmic horror story Abe is just one of those characters that you could listen to telling you a story forever. I'm just going to read a little bit of the opening of this so you can get a feel for the kind of character Abe is. He's got this sense of humor mixed in as he's telling you this really horrific tale. Don't call me Abraham. Call me Abe. Though it's what my mom named me, I've never liked Abraham. 
It's a name that sounds so full of itself, so biblical, so I believe patriarchal is the word I'm after. One thing I am not, nor do I want to be, is a patriarch. There was a time I thought I'd like at least one child, but these days the sight of them makes my skin crawl. Read The Fisherman if you haven't yet. All right. (laughs) Prompt number four, beauty amidst pain. For this prompt, I have chosen Full Immersion by Gemma Amore. In this story, we follow the main character, Magpie, who is dealing with major depressive disorder. And she's undergoing this experimental kind of treatment and something goes horribly wrong during the course of that treatment. So I don't really want to talk to you about that a lot, but there is hope woven into this story. And I don't want to say too much because I don't want to give spoilers, but just to kind of give you a gist of what I mean about beauty in pain, the author herself, Gemma Amore, dealt with depression She had a really difficult bout of what we would call in the United States postpartum depression, but what they call in the UK postnatal depression. So she writes a very touching, moving, personal introduction. So I just want to read a couple of things from her introduction. She opens her introduction to this book by asking, How much is a woman's life worth when you think about it? And as she goes on in the introduction, I just want to read other parts of of this and what she has to say. Anyway, for readers who are new here, I like to write forwards, partly in defiance of the forward naysayers, but mostly because I like to let folks know what they are in for when it comes to certain topics, themes, and content they might find distressing. And then she gives this reminder. Being broken didn't make me less valuable. If you're feeling cracked down the middle, I would like you to remember that. And she concludes the introduction with, I want you to know, I see you too. I see that shine. You aren't broken, not to me. You're brimming with potential, with hope, with wonderful things to come. You're riddled with wonderful cracks, anomalies, quirks, idiosyncrasies. Idiosyncrasies? Your babies love you, and I think you're incredible, and you're worth simply too great to quantify. Read full immersion, but check the content and trigger warnings first. Prompt number five, and I'm going to get a sip of coffee here first. Okay, prompt number five, beauty and incompleteness. And for this prompt, I chose Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. It was unfinished, um, rumored to be because he said he had too many possible endings in mind uh, for Christabel. But it is one of my favorite poems from the Romantic era. So I have chosen it for beauty in incompleteness. And it's a long epic poem, but I just want to read one stanza to you. The night is chilly, but not dark. The thin gray cloud is spread on high. It covers, but not hides the sky. The moon is behind and at the full, and yet she looks both small and dull. The night is chill, the cloud is gray. Tis a month before the month of May, and the spring comes slowly up this way. Love the poem, Christabel. Now, moving on. Prompt number six, beauty in place. And for this, I have chosen The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe. And I have chosen the section that describes the house of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building, 
A sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. I say insufferable, for the feeling was unrelieved by any of that half pleasurable because poetic sentiment with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate or terrible. I looked upon the scene before me, upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like windows, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees, with an utter depression of soul, which I can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after-dream of the reveler upon opium, the bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping off of the veil. There was an iciness, a sinking, a sickening of the heart, an unredeemed dreariness of thought which no goading of imagination could torture into aught of the sublime. What was it, I paused to think, what was it that so unnerved me in the contemplation of the house of Usher? Prompt number seven, beauty in time. For this prompt, I have chosen The Woman in Black by Susan Hill. And I am looking at time here in the sense of the timelessness and the eternal presence of the ghostly woman in black. So I'm going to read this passage to you. But out on the marshes just now, in the peculiar fading light and desolation of that burial ground, I had seen a woman whose form was quite substantial, and yet in some essential respect also, I had no doubt, ghostly. She had a ghostly pallor, and a dreadful expression. She wore clothes that were out of keeping with the styles of the present day. She had kept her distance from me, and she had not spoken. Something emanating from her still silent presence, in each case by a grave, had communicated itself to me so strongly that I had felt indescribable repulsion and fear. And she had appeared and then vanished in a way that surely no real, living, fleshly human being could possibly manage to do. And yet, she had not looked in any way, as I imagined the traditional ghost was supposed to do. Transparent or vaporous, she had been real. She had been there. I had seen her quite clearly. I was certain that I could have gone up to her addressed her, touched her. Prompt number eight, beauty in catharsis. For this prompt, I have chosen Gerald's Game by Stephen King. And I have chosen that infamous moment that most people know, even if they haven't read the book or watched the movie, what's become known as the degloving scene. I feel like too many people get focused on the brutality and the horror of degloving, but there is catharsis in that moment. Because if you don't know the story, I'm not going to try to get into the whole story here. But the main character, Jesse, has been handcuffed to a bed by her husband, and he dies of a heart attack while she is still handcuffed to the bed. She's in a remote, isolated cabin, so it's not like she can call out for help and have anybody hear her. There's a lot of stuff that's happened to her in the past, and there were a lot of things that happened with her and Gerald. Um, so I don't want to get into all of that, but I just will say that moment where she degloves herself in order to break free from the handcuffs is a very literal representation of what's going on figuratively, what's going on within her as she breaks free from her father's abuse and Gerald's abuse. So I just want to read not the degloving scene itself, but why I find it cathartic. 
Just as she was about to relax her aching arm, the cuff slid over the small protrusion which had held it for so long, flew off the end of her fingers, and clacked against the bedpost. It all happened so fast that Jessie was at first unable to grasp that it had happened. Her hand was free. Free. And now I want to go over a little bit to further expound on the freedom Jessie experiences, literally when she breaks free from the handcuffs, but also very much symbolizing her breaking free from the past abuse. The pain was bad, but these things were all but lost in an uprush of mingled hope and triumph. She felt an almost divine joy in her ability to roll across the bed without being stopped by the cuff around her wrist. It was ecstasy. I would say read Gerald's game, but very much so check content and trigger warnings. It's certainly not a book for everyone. And then finally, prompt number nine is to tag some people. So if you're watching this video, I would love to see you do this tag, but I am going to tag some specific people and I am tagging Nicole at Nicole's Bookish Nook, Kat at Kat's Novel Adventures, and Lauren at Happy Haunts Library. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you will return. So hit that like button, subscribe, hit that bell so you won't miss another video from me. Thank you again for watching. Bye.